about a time in my life. Most of you don't even know about it. But I was um, spent most of the day in bed. I had to eat food that was pureed. You know what I mean? I, I couldn't talk. Did anybody even know about that time in my life? I had, I was incontinent. And I was a baby. See, you guys were all feeling sorry for me. But when you found out I was a baby, it was okay. But how many of you are glad that we, most of us, will end up growing out of that stage in our life? Amen. And the thing is, when you grow naturally, it just happens. I mean, we don't have to do anything necessarily to grow from being a baby to a young child to a young man to a fully grown person. It just, it's just part of nature. It just happens. But it's different in the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, it's possible to remain a babe for a long time. And what I want to talk to you today about is how we can move from being a spiritual babe to being spiritually mature. It takes some intentional activity on our part. So let's begin by reading in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. Paul says, I, I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Spiritual people. That's what I'm talking about today. I could not address you as spiritual people, but as what he calls them is people of the flesh. So you see there's two different kinds of people mentioned here. Spiritual people or people of the flesh. He even calls them as infants in Christ. They were people of the flesh and infants. And then in verse 2 it says, I fed you with milk, not solid food. Just like in a baby, when you have a baby, the baby can eat milk typically. And then after a while you give them some you know, pureed food and so on, but Eventually, you want the baby to eat solid food. And the same thing is true about our spiritual life. Paul says, in your case, because you were not spiritual people, you were people of the flesh, you were infants in Christ, I fed you with milk and not solid food. How many of you here, if you had the choice, would want to eat solid food in the Lord? We all do, but you, you can't eat it if you're an infant. You, Paul says, I could not give you this solid food because you're unable to eat it. He says there in verse 2, for you were not ready for it. And I like, I like how he changes the verb tense here. He says, I fed you with milk. That's past tense, right? I fed you. You were not ready, past tense. But he, he says, even now. That's present tense. Even now, you are not ready. And in verse 3, still present tense, you are still of the flesh. Now, that's, a, that's kind of a... I would hate to have the Apostle Paul say that to me. If you remember back in chapter 2, I forget which verse it was. It says, we do speak wisdom to those who are mature, but it's not a wisdom of this age. Remember that? I would want to hear the wisdom that can go to those who are mature. I would not want the Apostle Paul or the Lord Jesus Christ to come to me and say, you know what? I have some solid food I want to give you, but you're not able. You cannot eat it right now because you are not spiritual. You are people of the flesh or infants in Christ. And then he tells them why they are not spiritual. 
you sometimes think about what is it that makes a spiritual person spiritual? What is a spiritual person? And you may have in your own mind an idea of what they are. Maybe they're people who kind of float around three feet off the ground. <laughs> really, that's not what a spiritual person is at all. You're going to find as we read the scriptures today that a spiritual person is very much a natural person, natural in the sense of do we just get along in life, but we do things in a certain way based upon God's word and God's principles. But he, here's the reason why he tells them they were not spiritual, they were people of the flesh. He says it's this reason. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh? So I can look at my life and I can see that if there is jealousy and strife in my life that's driving me, I'm not spiritual. See, I can come up here and prophesy and pray and preach and do all kinds of things, but if there's these issues in my life, like this, jealousy and strife that leads the way, I'm really not spiritual. I am a person of the flesh, an infant. It's possible, I think, for people who are of the flesh to be used in spiritual gifts. You know why? Because the Corinthians were. They were people who were of the flesh, people who were not spiritual, yet they were profuse in the use of spiritual gifts. So that's not really what it means to be spiritual. You might think all those people that come up here to prophesy or speak in tongues or give, those are the spiritual people. Not necessarily. They could be, but that's not what identifies them as a spiritual person. It's something different. And in this case, the fact that they were jealous and striving among themselves, saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, all that division that was there is the thing that Paul says identified them being fleshly people, people of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? What does he mean when he says behaving only in a human way? Well, I think there are natural tendencies as human beings that we have. And those natural tendencies might be, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. If you do wrong to me, I'm not going to forgive you. That might be a natural reaction. But as the Lord, I mean, just like we had this word of exhortation this morning about the love of God being a, a strong driver and motivator in our life, we as God's people have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and I don't have to respond only in a human way. I can allow the Spirit of God to begin to direct how I treat people, how I respond when somebody comes against me. Like if someone... Hits my cheek, I can turn the other cheek because that's what Jesus taught us to do. And I can do that because his spirit dwells inside of me. I can actually be a spiritual person in my response to the affairs of this life. I can be spiritual. On the other hand, I can do all kinds of things that look spiritual but be unspiritual. Because of my heart and my attitude and the way I respond to the things of this world. And so he says, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, are you not being, and here's that word again, merely human? I want you to know, how many of you know that you are human? Is there anybody here who's not human? Can I see your hand? <laughs> so we are human, but we're not merely human. We have the Spirit of God inside of us. We have been made a new creation in Christ. The thing that allows us to have dynamic change as people is that he lives inside of us. Christianity is not a, a, a self-help organization where you do these things to try to get better. It is allowing his life to come forward and be real and be active within us. It is more of him and less of me. Now, there's also in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13, if you want to go back there for one second, there, there, that's the scripture I was mentioning earlier. 
He says, uh, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit of God, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So that's when he was talking about there are spiritual people, and we can impart wisdom to those, but it's not you. You guys are not these people. Verse 14, he talks about the natural person. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. So there's three kinds of people mentioned in these verses in chapter 2 and 3. There's the natural person. That's just anybody who's not saved. The natural person. They're all around the world. And maybe even in this room today, there is somebody who's never really surrendered their heart to Jesus Christ. The Bible calls that a natural person. It's difficult for that person to accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. And it says he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Then there's the spiritual person. Verse 15 says the spiritual person judges all things, but he himself is judged by no one. So the three kinds of people mentioned here is the natural person, somebody who's not saved. There's the spiritual person, which to me is what I'm going to describe to you here this morning, the person who is moving on in the things of God, who is allowing the Spirit of God to direct and dictate their life. And then there is the fleshly person who is also a Christian, but is not allowing the Spirit of God to have a place of reigning within them. They are continuing in jealousy and strife and those things that are considered of the flesh, but they're called infants in Christ or fleshly, you know, what he calls people of the flesh. I guess it's not a bad thing to be a babe when you're a newborn Christian. How many of you know if you're a newborn Christian, it's okay to be considered an infant because you are. You, you just came out of the world. You're just beginning your walk with Christ. But the tragedy would be if you have been in the Lord for a year or three or five and you still remain an infant, that would be a tragedy. That would be a person who is no longer just an infant, but they, I think Paul would describe as a person of the flesh. Somehow their growth has been thwarted. Their growth has not moved on. They remained unchanged. They remained the same. Something's happening here. And maybe there's not, there's, there's not this intentional growth or the things that you need to be doing to see that growth take place, which I'll talk about in a few moments here. But as I said before, natural growth just takes place. You don't have to, you know, how many of you parents have had a little baby before and you said, I wish they would always stay this size. But then, you know, they're, before you know it, they're up and they're crawling around. They're grabbing things off the table. Then they're out driving your car. Or then they're walking down the aisle, marrying somebody. And then they're, they're bringing babies into the world. <laughs> That's just a natural growth. But Christian maturity doesn't just happen. You won't, you won't grow in the Lord just by sitting in this pew on a Sunday morning. It can help. But just like the Corinthians, you can be there gathering with the saints, going through all the things, and still remain as an infant. So my heart today is encourage you to be mature Christians. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 says, 1 John 2, 12, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, little children, he says. And then he says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who's from the beginning. And then he says, I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. So, you know, when John's writing this letter, I think what he's describing there is their spiritual condition, not necessarily their physical age, although he may be doing that as well, but I believe he's speaking to 
their spiritual condition because he's identifying certain things. Little children, your sins are forgiven. Fathers, because you've known him from the beginning. Young men, because you've overcome the evil one. He's identifying spiritual attributes to these age groups. And he says uh, in verse 14, I write to you fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the evil one. I'd like you to think for a minute today, wonder where you are in your spiritual maturity. If you're a babe, that's okay if you're newly saved. But if you think you're a babe and you've been saved for a number of years, it's time to move on. You, maybe you're a young child. Maybe you're a young man. Maybe you're a father in your spiritual maturity. I don't know where you are, but I think it would be good for you to do some, a little bit of self-evaluation and think about it in terms of some of the things we're going to look at here in just a few moments because the Bible does identify what it means to be a spiritual person. And one of them we just saw a few moments ago is somehow our attitudes are checked when we're a spiritual person. When you're a spiritual person, you're not given to jealousy and strife and things like that. You overcome that stuff. You walk beyond it. I'm not saying you never falter or never fail, but it's not like that's your identity. Something of Christ is stirring inside of you that moves you beyond this. That may be okay for a babe. It may be okay for a new Christian who's just learning, who's just learning to walk with him and respond to him. But if you've been in the Lord for some length of time, these things should be changing in your life because he's growing inside of you. He must increase and I must decrease. What does maturity look like? Well, there's a scripture in Ephesians 4 verse 11 and it says this, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, that's, what it, that's how it describes the role of men who are involved in the fivefold ministry. My job as a pastor is there, a pastor, a shepherd, is to equip the saints. Who's a saint? Anybody here a saint? You're a saint if you're in, in Christ. So he is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So one time we should take a picture of our congregation like this picture, snapshot, and on our website it says, who is the minister? Click the button that says right there. This is the minister. Right there. Because the saints are to be equipped for the work of ministry. And that's all for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. The idea is that when the saints are doing their ministry, when you're doing what it is that God's called you to do, then the body of Christ will grow. It will be edified. It will be strengthened and lifted up and encouraged. And then he has this little bit of a timeline thing. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, I don't think we're there yet, obviously. And the knowledge of the Son of God. And then he says this, to mature manhood. Mature manhood. Now, ladies, let me say to you, when he's talking about mature manhood, he's talking about women. Okay? He's talking about just people. All right? So don't be offended by this. He says he wants us to grow to mature manhood. And then he tells us, what that mature manhood is to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's a pretty high bar, isn't it? So what is Christian maturity? It is people growing into the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ. Now, when you look at that today, I know you're probably looking at that and you're thinking, I'm never going to attain that. Well, why not? That's his calling for you. Why would you just throw it aside and say, well, I could never attain to the measure of the stature of the Christ. Don't you know that that is the nature of his work within you to conform you to the image of his son? That's right. 
I hope that since you become a Christian, you become more Christ-like, more loving, more forgiving, more gracious, more kind, more patient, because his Holy Spirit is living inside of you. This is what maturity looks like. It's like people can look at you and say, I see something of Christ in you. I see the fingerprints of God upon your life. You once were this, but look what he's made you. Look how he's changing you. Look what you are becoming. So I think sometimes people read this scripture that says, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. They say, I could never get that, so I just give up on it. Don't give up on it. Say, Lord, do whatever you want to do in me to change me into the image of your son. Now, we're not becoming gods. We are just becoming Christ. Like he's, that's, that's like the, the fullness of his salvation inside of us is not just saving us from sin, but changing us, Amen. overcoming things in our lives. Read in the scripture all about how we overcome when we are in Christ. I wrote unto you young men because you are strong, because you've overcome the wicked one. I mean, we are having victory after victory after victory because Christ is inside of us. And so, get a vision for what it is God wants to do in your life. Mature manhood, that far end of that spectrum, looks more like Jesus. And maybe what your prayer should be is, Lord, what do you want to change in me? You know, David prayed this prayer in Psalm, I think it's 139, search me and try me. Search my heart, try me. See if there's any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. That's, that's the attitude and the heart behind a person who wants to go on to maturity. We shouldn't just take our Christian life for granted. And we shouldn't expect that we'll just become mature by the fact that we sit inside of a building on a Sunday morning. You know what I mean? Good. In Romans 8, 29... It talks about predestination. Predestination is this idea that God has determined some things to happen before they happen. And here's what it says in verse Romans 8, 29. Those whom he foreknew. Now, foreknowledge simply means that God knew things beforehand. The, how many of you know the Lord knew the day would come when you would be saved? He knew that. That's foreknowledge. But his foreknowledge has with it a predetermined end result. And so it says here, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Predestined for what? It doesn't mean here predestined to be saved. He says he's been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So how many of you are saved? Okay, a couple, two or three, all right. <laughs> We're going to have an altar call right now. No, if God has foreknew you, he foreknew you, you are saved, know this, you have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the predestination. It's like, where do you go after you're saved? Not that you would be saved, but where do you go after you're saved? It's kind of like this here. If you become a policeman, it's predetermined that you're going to get a badge and a gun and a uniform. You know, that's predetermined. So you become a policeman, guess what? The thing that's predetermined will take place. When you become a Christian, it's been predetermined that you should be conformed to the image of his son. So guess what? When you become a Christian, this is the work that he is doing in you. The Bible says he works in us both to will and do his good pleasure. He who began a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. What is that work? He's conforming us to the image of his son. So don't remain an infant. Don't remain as a fleshly person. 
Have a vision in your heart that God wants you to be spiritual. He wants to be able to give you spiritual wisdom. He wants you to be able to become more like Christ each year of your life. You, you may not notice the changes because sometimes they're very incremental, but a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, you are changing. You are becoming more like him. And men, you know, sometimes you find in our world, women pursue God sometimes more hotly than men. Men, can I tell you, let's take the role of leaders in this. Let's, let's plan to be spiritual men. Some of you guys, not all of you, some of you guys, and maybe not even in here, they're out looking for wives. And they're looking for beautiful women. And I'm telling you what, you're going to find some beautiful women who are hot for Jesus. And they don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> it doesn't matter how cool you think you might be if you're not hot for Jesus. <laughs> women, tell them that. <laughs> I mean, you might think you're the hottest thing since peanut butter, you know, cool, every woman wants you, but I'm telling you, they want a man who is serving God. They really do. They may not even know it, but there's something about a man who carries that character of Christ that is appealing and attractive to a woman. I'm not saying that's the whole reason you should be pursuing the Lord. Well, I better go on the bandwagon because my time's running down here. That's just a byproduct. It is what the Lord desires from us. So those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So if you're saved, if you're here today, that's God's goal for you. It's not just for the people up here who prophesy. It's not just for elders. It's for every Christian. Even a young child who's five years old and gives his heart to Jesus in Sunday school, he is predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So that he could be the firstborn among many brothers. Don't you want to be part of the band of brothers of Jesus? These are my brothers right here. They're, li they're like me. They're becoming like me. That's what I want to be, part of Jesus, the brotherhood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So that's spiritual maturity. So I'm going to go through the Bible here and just give you five or six marks of a spiritual person. Because if it's not these people here... What is it to be a spiritual person? How does the Bible describe a spiritual person? Well, the first thing is what we just talked about. A spiritual person's behavior will reflect the work of God and the Holy Spirit in his life. A spiritual person's behavior. In other words, things are going to change. Your behavior will change if you're becoming a spiritual person. You cannot remain the same and be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the scripture we read was, while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not in the flesh and behaving only in a human way? And that's where he was comparing, you are not spiritual people, you are persons of the flesh. The second thing, a spiritual person will embrace the wisdom of God and sound judgment. What do I mean? I'll read some scriptures here in a moment. But a spiritual person evaluates life and makes decisions in life based upon God's wisdom. In other words, we're, we're saying that God has a plan and a purpose. He's laid it out in his word. And we're not afraid to be able to say, I want my life to be guided by the Scripture. It's so easy to take things that we know to be true and just brush them aside for convenience. Well, I know the Bible says that, but in this case, I know the Lord will forgive you. Well, yeah. 
but you don't want to continue in life with that attitude. That is not spiritual. That is unspiritual. That is remaining a babe. That is letting my own appetites drive my decisions rather than, Lord, what is it that you have said? What is your wisdom? What is your guidance on this subject? And when you go seek for counsel from a person, a friend, or a pastor, or an elder, or whoever it may be, find somebody who's going to give you the word of God. The Bible talks about in the last days, there will be people who run around with itching ears, just waiting for someone to tell them what they want to hear. And if you ask long enough, and ask enough people, eventually you'll find somebody that will tell you exactly what you want to hear, and you'll say, I agree with that counsel. <laughs> That's what you don't want. A spiritual person says, I want to hear the word of God. And even if, even if that counsel goes against your desire, you hear it and you embrace it and you say, Lord, help me walk in it. This is spiritual maturity. There are many times I would say, even in my own life, where the correction has come from the word of God or someone has pointed something out and, and my response, by the grace of God, has been, Lord, I want to yield to your way. I know that when we were first married and we would argue, Ruth and I would argue, and Ruth would always pull out the Bible card. <laughs> we would be arguing about something or other. Of course, I know I'm right. She thinks she's right. And then she would say, well, you know the Bible says, and I'm like, you got me. <laughs> because our hearts, we want to do the Bible. We want to be spiritual people. So I encourage you, to allow the wisdom of God and the word of God to be the thing that you seek out when you're trying to find out what am I supposed to be doing in life. Amen? Amen. Teach your kids that stuff while they're young so it, it becomes part of their life when they're adults. That there's not even a question about what I should do in this situation because I know what the scripture says. Like I was talking to someone about, they were wondering who they should marry someday. I said, you know what? First of all, the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So, you know, right now, if you want to follow the Bible, about half the world's cut off your radar screen. But yeah, but he's rich and handsome. Well, but the Bible says he's not a believer, right? So we, we can justify a choice because of what we, I want that rich, handsome man. It's better to come over here and say, Lord, what do you want? It's better to choose his way. That is spiritual. That is moving in the path of spirituality. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 6, among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. So there is a wisdom that's for the mature it is the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2.13, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are what? Spiritual. Imparting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but he himself is judged by no one. So the spiritual person embraces the wisdom of God, and he embraces sound judgment. One last scripture about wisdom in James 3, verse 13. James 3, 13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works with meekness of wisdom. But... If you have bitter jealousy, see, he's the same kind of things he mentions in the Corinthian church. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Do you see that? That is not the wisdom from God. When we walk in these kinds of things that identify us as fleshly people, it is not wisdom from God. It is earthly, unspiritual, and even demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. 
But the wisdom from above is first pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's open to reason, it's full of mercy and good fruits, it is impartial, and it is sincere. It might be a good time for you sometime to do a Bible study on all those words. What does the wisdom from above look like? And he describes it right here. So a, a spiritual person will embrace the wisdom of God and sound judgment. The next thing... A spiritual person acknowledges teaching regarding spiritual gifts. Did you know that? Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. You know, there's a, there's a pushback against spiritual gifts sometimes in the world, in the community, in the church, even in the church. But he's basically saying, hey, if you are a prophet or you are spiritual, you need to acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command from the Lord. That's spiritual. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. And so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy. If you're in the church today and you see a spiritual gifts and you say, ah, I'm not sure that's for today, seek it out. Seek the Lord. Pray because those who are spiritual acknowledge this as a command of the Lord. And along with that, along with being able to acknowledge it, is that you pursue it. I want to be used, Lord God. It says, it says do not forbid speaking in tongues, earnestly desire to prophesy, but all things should be done decently and in order. I said it before, and I'd like to say it again. I'd like to encourage you men to pursue the use of spiritual gifts. Don't let it be just women. Stand up, men, and say, God, use me. Stir up the gift of God in my life. It is one way that God wants to use us to build up his church. And so he says it's a spiritual person who acknowledges these things as the commands of the Lord. I think a mark of a spiritual person is they will be being used in spiritual gifts. Not necessarily just prophecy, but you're going to step out in the spiritual gifts that God's given you. And he's given every one of us something. Next, a spiritual person has concern about the spiritual well-being of others. It's not about me. It's not about my things. It's about you. And so in Galatians 6.1, it says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression... You who are pastors should restore him. Is that what it says? How many Bible says that? You who are pastors. What does it say? You who are spiritual. There should be lots of people in a church where the church is becoming spiritual who are helping brothers and sisters who are struggling. This is what it means to be spiritual. That you can see someone who's Maybe they've, they've been caught up in some sin. It says here, caught up in a transgression. They're struggling in their faith. They're, they're becoming weak. Well, you who are spiritual should restore him. You go and you reach out and say, hey, brother, let me pray for you. Let me help you. Let me encourage you. Here's some scriptures. Here's how God's helped me or whatever it may be. But you begin to have eyes for others. The spiritual person, the center of his world is moving away from here to out here. That's spirituality. Yeah, you still have issues. We, we carry our own burdens and all that. But I'm really concerned about what's happening in the lives of other people. That's spiritual. That's becoming mature. I encourage you, if that's not happening in your, in your life, then say, Lord, build this kind of spiritual maturity in me that I can reach out to help a struggling brother or sister. You should restore him in a spirit of gentleness Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. The next thing is a spiritual person becomes intentional about their growth in the Lord. Remember I told you before that natural maturity just happens. Spiritual maturity takes some effort. And here's a scripture regarding that. 1 Peter 2, verse 1 and 2. It says, put away. Who's supposed to put it away? You're not, he didn't say pray to Jesus so he would take it away, did it? Does anybody see that in your Bible? Pray to Jesus so he'll take it away. He said, no, put it away. 
Put it away. You. That's a, that's a, a, a what's that in the English, in the English, uh, where they, it's a understood you? Oh, imperative, yeah, an imperative. Understood you. So you put away all malice. If you're walking around with jealousy and strife, put it away. Say, Lord, I'm going to put this away. I don't want this as part of my life anymore. I will put it away. I'm choosing today to not be a person of strife. I'm choosing today to be a person of love instead. So that's intentional. It's, it's not allowing that fleshly person to rule me today. I want you, Lord, to rule me. I want your ways to rule in my life. And so put away malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Put them away. Push them away from you. And then like newborn infants, listen to what it says here, long for the pure spiritual milk. The King James Version says it this way, desire, desire, long for. That's a good word, isn't it? Desire, the sincere milk of the word. Desire, the milk of the word. What's the next phrase say? That by it you may grow up into salvation. So you can see that I'm cooperating with God in my life as well. There are certain things in my life he is calling me to push away. There's other things he's telling me to desire. Now, if you're a person here today, you find yourself struggling with these things, malice, deceit, envy, slander, hypocrisy, then say, Lord, today I, I don't want to push them away. I, want, I don't want these things taking me down the road. Push them away and now, Lord, you know what? I really don't desire the word. I never pick my Bible up. I never spend time. And I have all kinds of reasons why I don't. But say, Lord, give me a desire. See, take an interest in your own spiritual well-being. Desire the milk of the word that you can grow. There's no way. Can I say it again? There is no way that you will move down the road to maturity apart from having an impartation of God's word. It is impossible. It is the milk of the word by which you will grow. Men, I hear a lot of men struggle with being in the word. There's no way, there is no way you will mature in the Lord unless you are taking the word of God in. And then finally, Colossians 1.28. This, uh, this is not necessarily one of those marks of a spiritual person, but it, is, it should be the focus of the ministry. The brothers here, you guys that are helping elders, leaders, working with people, discipleship, whatever you're doing, this is our aim, all of us. He is the one we proclaim Christ admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. That's our aim, to present people mature. When we sit down and counsel people, our aim is to move people to maturity, to make biblical decisions, to choose biblical wisdom, to push away certain things and pursue other things. It's, it's all about helping people to mature because the more mature a person will be, the less ministry they need, they begin to turn around and helping another person who's struggling. And then in uh, Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. Why does he pray for them? What is the nature of his prayer? What's the purpose of his prayer? That you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. If you want to pray for me, pray that I could stand mature in Christ. If you could pray for one another, pray that they would stand mature in the Lord. If you are teaching and admonishing, help move people to spiritual maturity. So what about you? We're closing up today now. What about you? 
Maybe you're here, you're a natural person, you need to pray for salvation. Are you a spiritual person? You know, we identified five or six things there. The Bible says this is what a spiritual person is. Are these things part of your life? If they're not, say, Lord, today, you know what? I want to move that direction. Do something in me to shake me loose. Move me off. Maybe I'm in a rut or maybe I'm stuck somewhere. I want to move on. I want to be something different. Change me, Lord. Or maybe you're here and you're just a person of the flesh. You know, you've been saved for years, but you've never really progressed. But today you realize, hey, I've got, I've got to move on. I want to, God, God's purpose, God's predetermined plan for me is to move on into maturity. And today I want to say, Lord, change me. Give me that burden. Give me that vision to be a mature brother or sister in Christ. And um, I think I wrote this down here. Maturity in Christ has little to do with our age or even the length of time you've been in the Lord. You know, I know Christians who've been saved a year who are more mature than some who've been in the Lord 10 years. Why is that? Because they push certain things away and they pursue certain things. That's the only difference. I think there's a psalm, I forgot to write it down here, but there's a psalm where David said, I know more than my teachers. You ever read that before? There was something about him who was pursuing God that even lifted him beyond his teachers. And it's not, that's not your goal, but he had a heart for the Lord. My soul pants for the Lord as a, as a deer pants for the water, he said. There was just something about it. And you could be a 12-year-old child or a 90-year-old man, it doesn't matter. It's the pursuit of the heart that makes the difference and determines our maturity. I'm going to close now. Um, I used to work on a dairy farm, and we had these cows, obviously. (laughs) And we would ring a bell at certain times when it was to milk the cows. But how many of you know, how did we get them into the barn? Does anybody know how you got them into the barn? Food. See, they weren't really interested. I mean, I'm sure some of them wanted to empty their bags, but I mean, at some level, they're wanting that food. So we had a special food. It was like this special grain. It wasn't just hay or something. It was like a mixture of all these good things. So when the, bell, the cows would hear this bell, they knew there was something waiting for me, and they came running to be fed. Well, that's what church is. I'm not calling you cows. <laughs> but we ring the bell. We don't have a bell, but we ring a bell, and we're saying, come and eat. One of the jobs of a pastor is to feed the flock. We feed with the word of God. And I want to share, I'm going to share this with you as a comparison of how our world has changed. When I was, a first, when I was first a Christian, we had church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and I was involved in a small group. How many times is that a week? How many times is that a year? Can anybody tell me? What is it? That's 208 208 times in a year I was feeding. Feeding. And I grew in the Lord in maturity tremendously. People wonder, uh, I became a pastor here after I was saved just four years. And people say, how did that happen? It's because I was feeding and responding. I was no one special, no different than any person sitting here. There was just a heart to pursue. In our church in America and in Alliance Christian Center, some people come to church one time a month. How many times a year are you fed if you come once a month? Anybody know? 12 verses 
208. And my guess is many who don't come frequently maybe aren't, don't have a daily discipline. Do you see what I'm saying? It's very possible that people could be in a church for years, years. And I, I understand this is not the only place you're fed, but this is a place where you're fed. I encourage you, to don't take your Christian walk in a, what's the word I want? A light manner. God is calling you to maturity. If the Lord is truly calling our church to plant churches, and I'll talk more about that in the future and how that will happen. Don't be scared about it. Don't be nervous about it. But you know what it's going to take? Mature people. We're not going to plant churches with people who aren't mature. You know what I mean? It's people who have something in their heart for the Lord. They're growing. They're becoming mature in Christ. And so I encourage you today to take a step toward being more serious about your own spiritual maturity. Don't think that you'll just float into it. Make an effort. Okay? Would you guys stand with me?